find a career that motherhood can accommodate. It's flexible. You can do it part time. You can do it from home. You can leave and come back. Why not tell this to young women early on and stop pretending that they're not any different from men? Raise your daughters differently than you raise your sons. That's a good thing. Not oh, a bad that's thing. a controversial mm-hmm. statement, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, all of these things have been lost in this land of equality. Really, it wasn't about equality. It's about interchangeability. There's a whole different way to do life. It's the countercultural way. It's not the way the culture is going to teach, but it's a way that works. It's practical. It's just not PC, so people don't hear it. Welcome back to the Lila Rose Podcast. Today, I'm going to sit down with Suzanne Venker, who is a podcast host as well as author and relationship coach, and we talk all things relationships. There's a lot of countercultural advice in this episode about how to date, how to date for marriage, even how to choose your career and your education as a woman in particular and why that matters when you're wanting to one day get married and have kids. We also talk about how to live on one income, some of the tough choices and decisions that a couple may make in order to maximize the best and healthiest home for both the marriage and the children. We talk about what are the absolutely essential attributes you're looking for in a man as well as in a woman and so much more. We even get into divorce and annulment a little bit and Suzanne shares some of her personal story. I hope you enjoy this episode. Suzanne Vanker, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. So you're an author, podcast host, and I think of you and the advice you give as a very loving big sister. I've been called that, I think, or mom, depending on how old the person is. (laughs) Yeah, although I prefer the big sister. I don't want to be that old. Okay. (laughs) I am a mom, so that's okay. Okay. So for folks who don't know your work yet, give us a little background on who is Suzanne Vanker. Yeah. So I started out... um, Really, I mean, I think of myself as a writer. That's what I love to do. I like being behind a computer. I like getting my thoughts out and organizing them. I love research. Um, So I wrote my first book when I was pregnant, actually, with my first, who's now um, 24 years old. Um, And that was about um, basically the needs of children and the importance of mothers being home. And that led into eventually, well, at the time, blogging was big. You know, blogging sort of gone the way of the dinosaur, I think. But at the time, it was new. And there were no videos and social media and all this that you have at your stage of the game. And um, so you were behind a computer if you wanted to, you know, be an activist or write and that kind of thing. So I did that for a number of years. And then um, I wrote, as I was able, something that you could do from home very easily with children. And um, eventually that became, uh, as the social media and the videos came on board, then it became a podcast eventually, and now I do relationship coaching as well. So I guess I'm a, I don't know what you'd call me. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, right? But writing is really my love and coaching. And so much of your work centers around women really leaning into their femininity Mm -hmm. and if their wives and mothers being able to fully live that out in a healthy way, and you have a lot of good advice along the way. What made you so passionate about that? So in 2017, I wrote a book called The Alpha Female's Guide to Men and Marriage. And I'd say of all the books I've written, that's been the most successful. And I think it's because it tapped into an extremely common dynamic of the strong and independent, successful type A woman who's always been around, right, but is in um, probably the norm today getting married and finding themselves in a power struggle with their husbands because um, they're, you know, the way I like to describe it is that you need a yin and a yang to a relationship and you need masculinity and femininity and those two things work super well together. But because we've essentially turned women into men by telling them they need to pattern their lives after men and be more like men for this faux version, excuse me, of equality, Um, They've sort of unknowingly adopted male traits, which my argument in that book was that that'll get you pretty far in the in the marketplace for sure. But it's it's a lose lose at home. And so that was the message of that book. And it really resonated. And that's when the coaching started, because people would read this book and be like, oh, my God, this is so me. It's like you're looking at my relationship and you're looking in my home and I read this. I get this. I've never heard this before. This sounds amazing. I need to do this, but how do I do it? I need help implementing it. And that's where the coaching came in. 
Okay, so let's start with that topic because yeah. it's such a good one. And I, <laughs> listening to you talk, I'm like one type from one type A woman to another, or mm-hmm. alpha woman to another. And again, I I actually sometimes think of myself as type B actually with the way that I operate in in my home and in my personal relationships. But when you're in any yeah. kind of public initiative and working really hard, people are like that person is type A. There's type mm-hmm. A qualities there. So I'd love to start with the book okay. and. Let's start with before you're married and you're you're kind of on a journey of self-awareness, yeah. maybe as a woman trying to make your decisions as a single woman. What would you, how should a woman think about her own, would you recommend her own kind of personality if she's more of a type A type personality to not squash her personality mm-hmm. and her God-given talents mm-hmm. because we were given them by mm-hmm. God to use them. Yep. And I think they're great qualities. Yep but to direct them in a way that is also not going to hamper our femininity. What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And the most common one, because it's almost like, is that even possible? How do you do that? Because for the longest time, and by the way, that book was part memoir for me, Mm -hmm. because I was going through this journey. And I had a mother who did not know how to turn it off. Um, And let me back up for a second and say, this is super important. This isn't necessarily related to whether or not you're employed. There are plenty of stay-at-home moms who struggle with this dynamic. They're the they're the CEO in fact, of the house. Yeah, yeah, I would argue it might even be harder for them <laughs> because they're in charge all day of little ones, and it's super hard to figure out how to not translate that to your husband at the end of the day and make him one of your kids, which is super easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and without any tutoring in that, or or just help on how do you you know how, what does that look like? Like you're asking you end up um, with many times with a relationship you really don't want to have because it's not pretty and it, and it goes south very quickly. So understanding first that it's okay to be one way in one scenario and another way in another scenario. And it's not a matter of changing who you are, which I remember I used to say that 20 years ago. I've been married 26 years this year. And I mean, there was a time when I would say and think, well, you married me. This is, this is my personality. Mm-hmm. What, what am I supposed to do about it? And I did believe that there wasn't a way to change. But in, in reality, I just didn't have the skills at the time. And I didn't have a model for that. So that book, like I said, was very much part memoir. So, and it's been a journey for me as well. But the issue is every space, you know, you go into a funeral, let's say, And you're not, your behavior isn't going to be the same as when you go to a party, right? There's parts of ourselves that um, you can tap into that will work in a specific environment. So when it comes to men and a relationship with a man, especially if you want it to be long-term, it it shines the more feminine you are and the more masculine he is. But we're just going to talk about women for a second. The less feminine you are, the more you're going to struggle, the more you're going to be fighting, I like to say fighting against the biological tide rather than Mm -hmm. working with it, which is smooth sailing when you work with it. And so whatever it is that you're doing during the day with your kids or at your job, let that be there and learn how to switch gears when when you come home at night and understand that those two domains just don't command the same behaviors. So what does that look like? Um, First of all, being softer. You know, a man doesn't want a hard charging, dictatorial woman in his home. You know, that's not what he married you for. He married you because you bring the softer, more receptive, or presumably at the beginning, women really understand this when I explain this, that, you know, when you first dated, I guarantee you, you exuded softness and receptivity. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you, you did. That's how you got them. You immediately went into your feminine because we kind of instinctually know how to do that when we're first um, getting together with a man. But something tends to happen over time. Or if you were tough, I would say there was that softness and vulnerability that brought you together. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what spoke to him. And he saw that. If you had been... I mean, I can't tell you how many women would, you know, if I remind them of, you know, go, go back 10 years, 15 years when you first met, are you anything like that today? Mm. And they're like, tough question. It is a tough question. And, and we've all been there and it's not anything to be, feel bad about. It's just to have an awareness of, look, here's what works and here's what doesn't. 
And if you want to go in this direction, the positive direction, think back to when it was easy. And that would have been probably when you were dating. And whatever you employed then, um, do it again. <laughs> I mean, it, and you're basically saying date your husband. Yeah. Keep dating him. Yeah. Be, the, be his, I mean, be his girlfriend. Be his girlfriend. Be his girlfriend, not his... Yeah, be his, his boss. girlfriend. Not his yeah, boss. not his boss. That's not what he signed up for. So you, you mentioned softness and receptivity. And I want to dive into your, you know, what is the feminine? Yeah. What is the feminine? Because, of course, the feminine, I mean, we give birth. The feminine mm -hmm. is extremely tough extremely. and can be extremely self-sacrificing, hardworking, courageous. I, you know, I think about St. Joan of Arc as an example or, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she did not leave him. She stood at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. Like, these are my heroes, you mm -hmm. know. But there's this, I think, a softness that underlies the fierceness. Mm -hmm. How else can we, should we see or think about femininity? Yeah, I think that's a super important point. Um, softness is not uh, weakness, which is, of course, what the culture teaches. So I'm all about, I mean, you asked me at the beginning, you know, who am I or what I do? I'm all about being as countercultural <laughs> as you can possibly be. And that's how you, that's how you're going to win in life. Cause I'm, I don't believe the culture we live in today is conducive mm. to happy marriages, happy families, happy relationships or any of that. So I'm all about, um, doing it the opposite of the way the culture teaches. So, um, yeah, softness and vulnerability go hand in hand and they're good things. And they're what going they're They are what's going to bring you closer and bring you that intimacy that I think most people are ultimately looking for and wanting. They just don't know how to go about it. Being soft doesn't mean not being strong. Soft and strong aren't even opposites, you know. Um, strong and weakness are, but you're strong on the inside. You can be strong on the inside and softer on the outside. I think women think they have to be 100% hard to maintain their identities to prove themselves, even though they don't have anything to prove. That's the irony of this whole thing. You know, they, they're they worthy just because they're women to a man. He's not looking for you to prove yourself to him. But they're following a trajectory and a path that um, is very male-focused and thinking that that's a better way to move through the world and finding themselves at a loss, you know, down the road when their relationships aren't working and when they're not happy trying to juggle both career and motherhood. And of course, that's a big piece of what I talk about too, is how to do that in a way that actually works for you rather than against you. How do we maintain peace in an ever crazy world? Prayer. Prayer is so key. And how do we pray? It's so helpful to have tools to remind us and assist us with our prayer. That's why I love Hallow App. Hallow App is the number one prayer app in the world. Hallow App has 10,000 prayers on the app. They have meditations, they have sleep stories, they have scripture, they have even content for kids. Tons of stuff to help you pray, whether you're driving, you're doing the dishes, whatever you're doing in your daily life, Hallow's got you and your family. So go check out Hallow today. You can download Hallow for three months free at the link in the description and join millions of other people in making prayer a daily part of your life. I really want to get into that yeah. topic. We talk about that a lot on the show, but I want to stay with this femininity, sure. uh, how to practically be feminine. Yeah. Maybe we'll go to that next because, you know, this all sounds beautiful, you know, be soft, mm -hmm. but strong and be, be willing to be receptive and vulnerable. And, you know, a man doesn't want, you know, the boss, he wants a you know a girlfriend, mm -hmm. he wants a wife, mm -hmm. but what does that look like yeah. practically? What are some practical tips you have maybe of things where women might miss, like mm -hmm. miss the mark here or misunderstand it because of the way they were raised or the culture? And how can they practically sure. be more holy themselves and feminine? So these are things they're not used to hearing. So they might sound a little, I don't know what the word is at first, but um, a lot more listening and a lot less talking. Hmm. Um, the idea, again, from the culture is that if you're not talking as a woman, you must be a mouse. You know, you're not standing up for yourself or for your rights if you're listening more than you're talking. But that's not how it works in a relationship. The quieter you are, the more you allow your man to open up because men are like women and it takes them a while to process their emotions. And we're always, you know, our emotions are always right there and always having to be felt and dealt with and spoken about. And that can be super overwhelming for a man. And if you give him the space to think and not jump in so much, then he 
will very likely come back to respond in the way you were looking for, whatever that was, maybe 30 minutes later. Mm. But you have to be quiet long enough to let it um, marinate. And so that's a that's a practical tool in communication with your spouse that um, or with your person that I think you can implement ASAP and you're going to find really quickly how much that works. So that's that's one to, to drill down on that really quick. Does yeah. quiet mean, as you describe it, avoiding interruptions, yes. maybe asking a question and letting it sit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sharing? Yes. But then not sharing so much that you're dominating the conversation, like, like create space, like practically, yes, all of obviously you're, you're not just saying, just sit there and don't no, say anything at not. all. And it's not about having no opinions. Um, although sometimes you don't have to necessarily share your opinion. <laughs> If you're somebody Novel who feels the need to share can. all the time, which again, trust me when I say these are all things I've lived and learned. I'm not talking from above and saying this is how I've been my mm -hmm. whole life and you should <laughs> you should emulate it. I'm saying here's what I didn't do right and here's what I've learned the hard way mm -hmm. and hopefully have changed. Uh, um, so yeah, that's that, that's one example is all those things that you said, just being quieter. And sometimes that quieter can be like, here's a, I wrote about this in the Alpha book. Um, and it sounds kind of, can that really be a thing? Even the way you move throughout the house can negatively affect your husband. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you're constantly frazzled and running from point A to point B and really intense and really anxious, that makes him anxious. Whereas if you are calmer and slower, you're going to bring out a better side of him that will then come back to benefit you as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I, I, men are very much responders of women. So they'll kind of, you're setting the mood of the room and then they'll react to whatever you're bringing to the table. So if you go up, he might go up and then you're not going to like him going up because that's not really what you're looking for. Um, but if you're calmer, sort of like what I said about the speaking, you know, and giving him the space, then you, you set up a dynamic where the relationship is just mutually beneficial as opposed to you feeling like you have to dominate it all the time because he's not responding the way that you want. So in other words, changing yourself will ultimately change him and the relationship rather than beating him you know, over the head with a stick, metaphorically speaking, um, to be different than he is. So there's a way to work with a man to get the best out of him. And I would argue this for this works in reverse too, mm. There's, but we're not here to talk about men, I guess, right now. But <laughs> um, well, I mean, well, why I mean, not? Let's talk about it at all. Um, the the one one word that I don't know if you use this word, but it's kind of underpinning a lot of what you're saying is sweetness, mm -hmm. kind. I mean, mm -hmm. kindness, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I do think in the culture there's this narrative maybe that if you're too sweet as a woman, you're a doormat. Mm -hmm. And there are some women who have unfortunately become mm -hmm. doormats because they think that kindness or sweetness equals constant. I'm going to use this word, which is a you know a trigger word, but submission to whatever yeah, the, no. the show is mm -hmm. going on over here, which can yep. include abuse, bad yep. things, you know, mm -hmm. having boundaries crossed, whatever. So what does sweetness and kindness, a consistent sweetness and kindness to your man look like in the context of healthy boundaries? Yeah. Because the naturally sweet women I've noticed in my life, my, my life experience, some of the more like naturally tend, tend to sweetness. And if they don't have maybe good moral models or yep. they struggle with people pleasing, they are, they do tend to get into sometimes relationships that are not healthy. They do. Where boundaries are crossed and they open themselves up to unhealthy um, treatment. You have to have some of this going on in your relationship where it's just going to be um, flat. So I am not suggesting anything like being a doormat, but I understand your point. And I do think there are women who, some women who struggle with that. I don't think that they're the norm today I, 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 because of the way the culture fosters the hard charging women, woman, she's more common hmm. from my experience, certainly than, um, than the docile sort of submissive type. Um, but you're right. There's a balance there. And those women need to understand that it's, this isn't about you're not having your needs met or your opinions heard. And that those opinions matter just as much as everybody else's. Those women probably will struggle more to learn how to speak up rather than what I'm speaking to, certainly in that book, Alpha, which was I was mm -hmm. speaking to a different type of woman who needs to tone it back. 
you're speaking, I think, to the woman who needs to learn how to stand up for herself speak out. and speak up and know that your voice is not any less important than your man's or anybody else's for that matter. And that's, that's a different skill. That's a different skill is learning how to make sure you put yourself out there and um, make sure you're heard and have an equal say in, in, in matters. That's not really the women I work with are the ones that I specialize in, <laughs> but I, I understand that they, that they are there. <laughs> So I think it's a good point you're making because it's basically there's different personalities and life mm. experiences that make you kind of naturally respond or tend to respond one way or another. Let's go back to the alpha woman because as you say, that's that's your your expertise. And I agree. I do think the culture is trying to shape those sort of, you know, women in the boardroom, you know, women, equal number of women at the in the C-suite as anywhere else. Uh, so what does it look like to channel your alpha in your relationship with your husband in a way that you are maximizing the the goodness of that relationship. You're really leaning into a healthy, healthy relationship. Just overall now. You're not talking about a certain pet personality type. Well, I mean, or, we're talking kind of alphas, I guess. Like the, the but, woman that has that alpha personality, that the 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 kind of high achieving yeah. leader, natural leader type well, woman. You know, I think at the base of this is understanding that this isn't a contest. You're not in a fight with, well, hopefully not with men as a rule, but hopefully, it's definitely, hopefully not with your spouse. So when you have this mindset, well, here's an example. I, I'm really put off and concerned about the terminology that a lot of millennials and Gen Zers even now coming up behind them are using that they've been taught to use, which are words like his and hers, contribute they often have to do with money, but the mindset is very much an individualistic, you're here and I'm here, and you're in a you're in a fight for fairness. Equality. Equality. And it's so ingrained in them, they don't even know, I don't think that that's what that's how it started mm -hmm. and that's what they're doing. Now it's just mm -hmm. in the culture. But it is so telling that you're struggling your, with your relationship because of the way you're thinking about it. And so the, the alpha thing kind of goes hand in hand with that because your man isn't trying to hold you down or back or oppress you in any way. And if you think that he is in some way, you're going to constantly be looking for your part of the pie and you're trying, you know, you're going to have, you're going to think you're in a power struggle when in fact you're, you're not. He wants you to be happy. He wants to serve you. He wants to help you be happy. That's all he lives for. So it's a real mind shift about men really and, and women and the relationship that they have and what it's, how it's meant to work versus how you've been taught to think it's supposed to work. Complimentary versus competitive. And you've been, not you personally, but your generation has been raised in the, and certainly partly mine, um, has been raised to believe it needs to be or should be competitive, competitive, when in reality it was supposed to be complimentary. And that, in my opinion, is the reason why so many young couples are struggling. Hmm. That's it at the core of it, is that misunderstanding that they, that this idea that a woman who's not uh, bringing home a paycheck for X amount of years while she's home with her kids is somehow less than. I mean, that was something, that was, that was junk that they were sold. Those are lies that they've been fed, that they believe. And because um, they never had anybody tell them otherwise, you know, there's no understanding that it, it doesn't matter what role you're playing within the marriage, because ultimately you're a team working toward the same goal. It doesn't really matter if he's bringing home the paycheck and you're not, your his paycheck is your paycheck. This is so frustrating for me because people look at me like I'm crazy because they've never heard that before. That's why they say like my husband's money or his money or how can I say it's his money? Oh, his I, career. What? What? Do you, no, no, mm -hmm. that's not how it is. It's it's one. You are one unit. You are a family. You are. That's what marriage is. You become one, and you're two people doing maybe separate tasks but working toward the same goal. His money is your money. He's you're, you're working it every day. You're doing the hardest job in the world, and he wants to support that. So all of these things have been lost in this land of equality that we live in, this attempt to be, really, it wasn't about equality. It's about interchangeability, about pretending that men and women essentially don't have any differences. 
when of course they do. And then those differences mm-hmm. show up big time once the children arrive. And that's when, you know, because they weren't set up to understand that that was going to happen when the babies came, you know, that, the, oh my gosh, I want to be home, but we made all these decisions based on a different mm-hmm. set of priorities or a different set of beliefs. And now I don't know how I can be home financially and my husband won't support me. And I'm getting ahead of myself. I know you want to talk about No, I things, do but... want to. I mean, that's, it's funny. I'm thinking, oh, there's so many things here yeah. to talk about. Okay. So, well, let's stay with that uh, for a moment because I think it is connected to the whole alpha and femininity, masculinity yeah. in the relationship. So for married couples, and I've, you know, I've run into this in my own uh, community, friends who are married and yeah, they have their children and then they realize I don't want to be working full time. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm going to have a full-time job, I want it to be very different than the one I have because the one I have is not flexible and conducive to the household. And so I need to take a pay cut or I need to just quit or these are the desires that the woman might be experiencing. But they're on this two-income household. This is how they they bought their house. This is how they're mm-hmm. set up. And there might also be uh, concerns or you know miscommunications between the spouses where the husband was expecting her to bring mm-hmm. home at least some of the bacon to support the family economically, how do you navigate that? It's a mess. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. It is a mess. Those are the people who call me in their thirties. Most of my clients are in their, are in their thirties. Um, I do get single women too, but, but mostly uh, they're in their thirties and, and they're married and they're married. And that's why I wrote how to build a better life. And the subtitle is, um, a new roadmap for women who Mm -hmm. want to prioritize love and family so that you can start early on mapping out a life that doesn't have you calling me when you're 35, right? There's a whole different way to do life. And it's the countercultural way. It's not the way the culture is going to teach, but it's a way that works. And it's practical. It's just not PC. So people don't hear it. So one of that's one of those things starts with choosing a career that works well with motherhood. You know, my parents taught me this. They were mm-hmm. great. They're not here anymore, but they were born in um, 1922 and 1930. So they're, part of the greatest generation and, um, highly educated, uh, very successful and also extremely practical. (laughs) We don't get a lot of that anymore. So, um, I'm pretty practical through and through. And I'm like, I don't care if it's popular, it works, you know? So one of them is find a career that motherhood can accommodate. It's flexible. You can do it part-time. You can do it from home. You can leave and come back relatively easily. You know, nursing and teaching are obvious ones for those. But when you talk about that, um, you know, you get blowback because what are you saying that women shouldn't be able to, you know, do whatever they want to do? Um, sure, you can. No one's stopping you. And you're certainly capable. But you're probably not going to want to. And it doesn't feel that way now when you're 22, but it will 10 years from now. I can almost guarantee it. And so your life priorities change as a woman and you in your life has seasons. And it's different for a man. His His path is very linear, right? Find woman, have babies, make money for babies. I mean, it's it's not um, it's not really much more complicated than that. They don't have bodies that produce life and that breastfeed and that nurture in those early years in the same way, and so they think differently. Whether or not they even realize they're thinking differently, it's just natural. So why not tell this to young women early on and stop pretending that they're not any different from men? Mm-hmm. Raise your daughters differently than you raise your sons. That's a good thing. Oh, a that's thing. a controversial mm-hmm. statement, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And it has yeah. nothing to do with ability. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want, whatever you set your mind to do. This is not an intellectual uh, 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 competition it, or even an ability competition. This is about the fact that your body does this, his doesn't, and therefore your trajectory is going to look different. Plus, he's a man, you're a woman, and you're not the same. And those differences are going to come glaring at you when you have children. And that's, there's a way to assume that ahead of time. Um, And even if I'm wrong and that doesn't happen, at least you've set yourself up for success and you don't have to follow that path, but at least you have options down the road. So for example, if you are going into a hard charging career with no thoughts of marriage and motherhood and you're postponing all of that and you're, you know, laser focused, um, you're going to find yourself stuck. And you're like, all of a sudden you have to find a husband, have babies, financially figure this out, figure out what to do with your career because it's connecting, you know, because it's um, colliding with your clock, biological clock, all in your 30s. This is a terrible plan. It's It doesn't work for most people. There's outliers, you know, there's people for whom it has worked out. But 
I wouldn't bank on it. So why, why, why do this all in the name of politics and so-called equality when you're the one who's going to get hurt and, you know, politically they may win and get what they want, but, um, your life isn't. And so, so that's, that's the most obvious change in my opinion is choosing a career that works well with motherhood. Such good advice. And it's funny, there's so many big corporations now that are offering egg freezing and reproductive technologies because they want the bio, they want the fertile years of that woman to be their workhorse and to delay and postpone, like you said, love and marriage and kids. And they're kind of promising, well, you can do it when you're 40. And some people, women can make it happen when they're 40. But I mean, apart from even the ethic, ethical concerns with all of that, which mm -hmm. there are tremendous ones, mm -hmm. it's very ethically fraught, I would say immoral. Very. But alongside, it's just not even practical. It's not practical. Um, bingo. Definitely ethically uh, questionable, but more importantly, impractical. Work with the body God mm -hmm. gave you. This is what you have. Work with it. It's meant to be worked with. It will work for you if you work with it. For most people, um, instead of you know trying to fight it and twist it and turn it to to benefit you, um, or benefit more specifically your your career plans. What what careers would you recommend for women? And what's a good kind of rubric for how women should think about getting into career and, and also college for that, that matter and, yeah. and yeah. higher education? Yeah. Well, I, if you're asking me call it, what my thoughts are in college, I think it's going to change dramatically in the next 10 years. It already I do is. not think it can, I, it cannot continue this way. I think trades are going to come back. I think people are going to stop paying this a ridiculous um, amount for a, a stop going into student uh, debt, college debt. This is crazy. If you can't afford it, you take out a small loan or you don't go or you go to a smaller college. You mm -hmm. figure something out. Or community colleges. Or community colleges. Mm -hmm. Quit taking on. You are setting yourself up to fail by taking on this debt. There's a domino effect when you take that on because you can't afford things down the line. And then all of a sudden your, your life gets backed up with this debt. So um, there's that. Um, also, I mean, in terms of what careers there are, there are the obvious ones that are, like I said before, nursing and teaching um, but there are, and a lot of other ones that are more traditional that way that work with motherhood. But there's also a lot of ways to go into law and medicine, as we were talking mm -hmm. about, that um, that you can do down the road part time, and aren't as demanding. Really, what I'm honed in on are the demanding full time, all of your focus. That's your life kind of career, and that's supposed to be considered empowering. And it and it might feel that way for a year or two, <laughs> but not for long. Not for long, because you have no life if you choose those types of careers. That's politics. That's for some, in some cases, medicine and law. That's why I'm saying be careful about which, um, which kind that you choose in that. In that, I mean, we know with law and medicine that there are more females in schools getting those degrees and also dropping out down the line. It is crazy. I think it's sixty percent of women. Sixty percent of people graduating law school today are women. Sixty percent. But law of all professions, I mean, there's also, you know, the medical field too, but your sheer hours requirement, yeah. if you're full time, right. it's, it's brutal. It if is If you're brutal. trying to be a mother, I, I, it's almost impossible. And so they step back and out. If that doesn't show you, and men don't do that, the men who are in law. So you're saying statistically the men are staying in yes. and the women are leaving, yes. but more women are entering. Correct. Showing mm -hmm. that there's an interest there, mm -hmm. right? But then reality hits. In a way, if for them, in a way that it doesn't for a man. And you can you can respond to that one of two ways. You can get up in arms about that and try mm -hmm. to change the world and try to get all political about it. Or you can just work with your own life and choose something that works for you and stay, in, stay focused on you and what you want for your life, not what the culture is going to do. Here's a controversial question. Do you think that the uh, lack of ability of most men to provide for a family on a single income yeah. – or at least a parent lack of ability. We're going to get into your, you know, secret guide for how you can make it work with, with on a single income. But is that in part because we've just said, oh, women absolutely should be in the workforce? Oh, a hundred percent. Remember when you at, or when I said men will respond to whatever, mostly what women are doing, they're going to respond to it. My argument has been that you know, we basically said women want men's lives, so then we go out and we told women to create their lives like men. So they did. So men here, men are looking at it like, well, if that's what they want and that's what makes them happy, 
okay. And so they support it. And then in their own way, sort of step back because a man is going to naturally kind of get out of your way if you want to shine. And that will compete with his desire to provide, which is innate in him in a way that it isn't for a woman. A woman does not typically have an innate desire to provide for her husband. That's not really her impetus for working generally if she's married, but for a man, it's everything. And so he's sort of in this tug of war between his inherent need to provide and then looking at his wife wanting to do that and trying to work with it rather than say, hey, don't, I'm going to do this. They don't do that, men, as a rule. And so they're kind of stepping back professionally. And there's more reasons for this. We have father absence. It, it's a mess, really, what's going on with men. And we go down a rabbit hole there. But generally speaking, they're, they're stepping back because this is what women said they wanted. And then women are finding out, wait, where are all the good men? Where'd they go? When they really mean is where are all the marriageable man, men, which really means where are all the employed men? Why aren't they on a track? I can't stay home if they're not. I mean, that's, that's what so, I mean by it's a mess. You're, 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 it's so uh, boiled down in a good way. The way you're just like, where are all the good men? Actually, with the marriage of men, actually the employed men. I mean, really, it it, it comes, I mean, just not say to, what it is. Or I mean, the men with employment it, prospects. I'll yes, put that in there. Yes. Meaning they're hardworking. They're, they're on a path yes. to be a provider. Yes. And because not just we've, live on the couch or whatever. Correct. Yeah. I mean, we've we've created the men we have today as a society. We it's It's our fault. And by our, I mean political, really women, political, previous generation. I mean, um, churches, they've been afraid. They've been afraid to st really what we're talking about is feminists. That's really how this all started. So it's, you don't even use that label anymore because it's just in the culture. It's just how you think, how you've been taught to think, mm -hmm. but that's really how it emanated. And even churches are afraid to stand up to that um, mindset for lack of a better word. So they, they jump on, they've jumped on board too. And it used to be that we could count on churches to sort of help women kind of in the way that I'm trying to help mm. women in a more, with a more balanced approach. But, um, no, they're just as political from, you would know more about that than I would, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's my understanding. A big thank you to our sponsor, Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is America's meat delivered. Did you know that when you go into the grocery store, up to 90% of the meat, even if it says product of the USA, is not from the USA. It's imported in and then they slap on that label, product of the USA. With Good Ranchers, 100% of the meat, the poultry, the pork, all of it is farmed and raised in the United States. What is so awesome about Good Ranchers is that they're a pro-life, pro-family company that shares your values and sends you absolutely delicious meat. I love their steaks, I love their chicken. Their chicken is delicious and juicy and tender and you're gonna love it too. Right now, Good Ranchers has a special going on where you get $100 off your first order plus a year's supply of free Wagyu burgers. Let me repeat that. You get a year's supply of free Wagyu burgers. That sounds really good. And all you have to do is become a monthly subscriber and get your box of delicious chicken and steaks directly to your door. So go to GoodRanchers.com today, become a subscriber, and get up to $100 off plus a year's worth of free Wagyu burgers. Don't forget to use the code LILA at checkout to get up to $100 off and a full year's supply of free Wagyu burgers. That's GoodRanchers.com and use the code LILA at checkout. So what does it look like for a young woman? Okay, you're recommending find the career and make your in educational decision, your education, your decisions for education based on practical considerations. Yep. How much it will cost? Yes. Can you afford this? Yep. Uh, is this career going to be flexible in the future yep. for a child that you may hope to have when you're married, et cetera, right? Yes. What about finding that husband? Yeah. What's your best advice Dude, for My best advice is for that is um, people think, you know, there's no question that dating has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I would not want to be 23 today at all. Um, I feel like or, I got the last uh, boat out of, like, like, <laughs> out, of the, out of the war yeah. because I, yeah, we, I got married at 30. <laughs> I had just turned 30. I met my husband at 28. And it was like, okay, I really felt like it was God's timing. I want to get married yeah. now. I hope I can, yeah. you know, Lord yeah. willing. I was always open to being married in my 20s, but it just wasn't yeah. the right guy yet. Uh, but I look at what the complete chaos, because dating apps were around when I was dating. Mm. And, you know, but now it's like, that's, it seems like everyone's best hope is the dating I app. I know, I know. As, as 
problematic as dating has become, I don't think it's as complicated as people think. There is a way to do it more strategically and a little bit more businesslike from the get-go so that you keep yourself from ending up with somebody uh, for years. You basically, you shouldn't be spending so much time trying to figure it out. It should be kind of pretty obvious early on. So how do you do that? What do you I mean, mean by I'll that? I'll just give you an example. I'll just use me as an example. I, I was married at 23, divorced at 27, remarried, no kids. That was my college boyfriend. Remarried at 30, had my kids at 32 and 35. So let's just put that trajectory out there so people know where I'm coming from. When I met my second husband, it and you don't have to be 29. I met him when I was 29, but you could do this at 23. Within three dates, we knew where each of us was headed. I don't, I wouldn't say we decided we were going to get married, obviously that early, but we knew right away what the other person wanted and what the plan was. And that includes work and family, by the way, who, conversations that people just aren't having. And what I say is, why wouldn't that come up when you're dating? I mean, isn't, what else are you doing if you're not doing it the cultural way, which is, oh, don't worry about marriage later, just have fun, hook up, you know, this, all this terrible messaging about dating that women are becoming part of um, is keeping them from having substantive conversations early on in the dating process. I think out of fear that the man will run or something if they know that you want to get married or if you're looking to get well, married. Well, and many well, do. Then, then I mean, good. For, for, Great. Sayonara. There you go. Move <laughs> on. You just saved me a, yeah. a lot of time. Probably years of your life potentially. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's What's such a good point, that? Suzanne. What's wrong with that? I don't so, understand. So what you're saying is it's such a good point because I, I think I, I, I see this a lot with young women today that they want to not come on too strong. I mean, I'm not talking about like sexually because yeah, right. that should be off the table till yep. you get married. Yep. Um, I'm talking about in terms of what they're looking for. They're dating for marriage yeah. and they want to kind of play it, be fun, be chill, play it cool, you know, be kind of normal, whatever. And so they don't want to come across as like, yeah, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in this like a business to, you know, get married. Like this is a, this is a decision that is very serious that I'm looking to make. Like they don't want to come across yeah. too intense. How, mm. how do so, you, so, okay. So what do you do? <laughs> nothing wrong with having fun when you're dating, have, have a good time, but presumably, and here's another thing that's really supposedly so taboo. I say, if you're not having sex, which you shouldn't be in the beginning anyway, what else are you doing? I mean, what is dating if you're not going out and having conversations for hours and hours and hours? You're on the phone, you're on FaceTime, you're face to face. What are you doing if you're not having sex? <laughs> you're presumably talking a lot. And what are you talking about? Are you talking about the weather? Or are you talking about your upbringing, your past mm -hmm. history, what you want, where you're going? What, like, that's the most natural thing in the world to me. Well, why can't you have those sub substantive conversations while you're also having fun? You go out, you enjoy a nice meal, you go to the movies, mm -hmm. you do whatever, but you're also talking about you. You're just being real. Just be real. If you don't feel like you can be real, then you're probably not with the right person. So there's a lot of sort of quick red flags at the beginning. Um, if it feels wrong, it probably is. If it's icky, it probably is because it is icky. Um, and you'll know when you've found at least a match if the conversation flows super easily and if there's no game playing, you're just, you're being you and he's being his, his self, himself in response. And this advice I think works because it works when you as the woman, putting on the woman's role here, you know where you're at. You have self-awareness, yes. you know where you're aiming toward, what you're aiming towards. Because if you are going into dating, just looking for like affirmation yeah. or to quell loneliness. Yes, that is a good point. Then you're, you're maybe not going to have, the red flags won't feel like red flags because you're on the wrong path yeah, anyways. will also pick up on that. And, 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 and there'll be that. issues on that end too. Yeah. So you, you've got, I think, so I think maybe starting with the proper disposition for going into dating as a woman would be what? Excellent. Good point. Um, knowing what you want and where you're going and who you are. I mean, you said it yourself. You are absolutely right. That's an excellent point. Um, and when you bring that to the table, that's, that's addicting. I mean, they, he's going to want to be around that. He wants a woman who knows what she's doing and where she's going and what she wants. Um, I just think there's too much, um, 
too much of a move, like a like a board game, like a move, and then you wait to see what he does. And then you would just, just the same way that you would have presumably maybe spent time in high school with the opposite sex, being yourself, a little, a little more comfortable space because you're not thinking about marriage. Same kind of thing as that. Is it ever okay for the woman to make the first move? Uh, what do you think about that? Um, so the short answer is no, <laughs> but, um, and there's a reason for that. It's a, there's a practical reason for that. I keep using the word practical. Um, you want a man who, who sees what he wants and can go after it. That's really what important. about the dropping but the handkerchief? I was just going to say okay. that. I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, um, but with, that's a move. With, that's absolutely. A move. The only caveat to that is exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. And women have been doing it for centuries. You strategically place yourself in his line of sight. And maybe it is dropping. I don't think we have handkerchiefs anymore, Lila. But um, but what does it look like yes. in the modern world? Because um, I mean, it might, it just might be um, walking to the bathroom and drop. Yeah, I mean, it might be dropping something, you know, um, or bumping into or being near, just, just not making the overture as if you're the man coming up to um, hit on him. So you're not going to hit on him in an open way. Well, in a way, what you're saying, it sounds like in a way, the woman kind of does make the first move, but it's <laughs> kind of a sneaky move. Yes. And this does seem, I mean, were, I, I'm pushing on this a little bit because you were okay. saying earlier, it's not like a board game. It's not like a you know, yeah. game of chess, <laughs> but I do think there's a little bit of a there dance. Is a, there is a dance. There's like a, a cadence, yeah. I would say. Yes to getting to know someone. And sometimes it just kind of happens. It kind of falls on your lap or just sort of like, you know, that's, that's maybe true. wrong wrong terminology to use, but it kind of yeah. just, you know, it just unfolds. Yep. But sometimes, you know, you got to be, I think, strategic in terms strategic. of putting yourself, like yes. you said, in places where yeah. you're most likely to meet a guy or being available, even doing the dating apps. I've met so many girls. I mean, mo probably half the women I know in the last decade who have successfully gotten married, met their guy in an app. Let me answer that just for a moment, because I, as, as much as I don't have personal experience with that, I was with my daughter and her um, roommate a couple weeks ago, and she was doing the back on the dating apps. She had taken a rest for a few months and she goes back on there and I never actually watched it in action. So I watched how she put the thing together and how you hit these things. And then they respond, right? I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is, I was, it, I could see it being very addicting and also kind of scary in a way because you have everything out there and you basically have to try to find a diamond in the rough, right? Well, the woman is supposed, if it's a match, so the guy clicked on it or depends on those sites. Some sites, the it woman hinged. makes the first, like coffee yeah. meets bagel. The woman makes the first move. Yeah. No, so that I don't like, but if they respond, if, if you put yourself out there and they respond, then you can respond back because they're, you put yourself out there, they're responding and then you're responding to the response. <laughs> But I wouldn't call him or text him first, ever, right, ever, right. ever. And I, I agree with that. And what if, if they he, can't if do he, that or don't, then he's not your person because he doesn't have the ability to go out there and get it. What if he leaves his number? Should you call him? No. No. Mm -mm. Why would he leave his number? I'm just saying, like, okay. you're out and about and he, a guy leaves you his number. Oh, super excited call to me. talk to you. Can't wait. But that's all you got. He's already gone. I don't know. I'm just, we're just, you mean, putting it, I don't like, know how these work. You're so, making eye contact. You're saying, oh, you you're mean, like, you're, you're the guy. person now. I yeah. You meant on the I'm app. sorry. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Say it again. Cause you're saying never I'm, text first, but let's say yeah. you're out yeah. and you meet some guy and he somehow leaves you his number or he gives his number to a friend to give to you. And he says, can you call me? But you know, if you want to talk to me, can you call me or something like this? Well, first of all, no, I would, um, that's a hard one because, um, <laughs> I would right? either, Sometimes I would it's a either little say, tricky. first of all, I would hope that that, I don't, because to me in my world, it was the other way around. The guys would say, can I have your number? That was just what you did. So now I'm having to put myself, gosh, are people really doing that? Would a guy actually I've heard that. Number? Yeah. So if they do, I would say, well, I don't call guys, but here, if you want my number, you can, or. I like that. I would just say, I don't call if you guys. Think he, if, if you, if you if like you, him, give him your number. I'm just like, yeah. here's mine. I like that. I think the bottom line of what you're saying, which I really like, is that you want to empower the man to be the leader. Yes. And you want you are leading in a different way, uh, in, a, in a receptive way, backhanded or whatever it is. But you want to give him the op opportunity. Yes. You want to create space, just like the conversation stuff. You're that great advice early about like let them talk, like let the other. And by the way, this works for friendship too, quite mm -hmm. frankly, or really any relationship, your kids, but especially with your husband, like you want to give him space to, to talk. You want to give him space to, to share in dating. You want to give him the opportunity if you're interested in space to ask you out, to pursue you. And in fairness to men today, they've been basically 
I mean, they've been told their masculinity is toxic. And so they don't know what to do anymore. They don't even, Mm. I think they are genuinely confused. You know, back in my day, men, just like I said, you just, you you made the overture and if you got turned down, oh, I'll move move on to the next one. We were a lot thicker skinned in my day. It was just a little different. Um, And that's why I wonder, because it is, um, it is so confused today. Mm Mm-hmm. To be a little nicer, to understand the man may not be reaching out for that reason. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. And to maybe be willing to take the risk. Like mm-hmm. I have one friend and her story is, I mean, she's very feminine. He's very masculine. She did ask him out. Yeah. But she could tell he was interested or she really thought he yeah. was. And he, and, and she could tell like based on personality and, and culture yeah. probably. Yeah. She wasn't sure if he had mm-hmm. permission. You know. So it's complicated, th- right? It is complicated. I do think that these massive cultural changes have created a very messy situation where people are almost frozen. They don't Mm. know what to do. Um, So you do have to read it a little bit better. You have to read the room, read him. And it's not a hard line thing. It's not like that would never work if you made the overture. It's just generally speaking, um, if you're, if you think you've met somebody um, who, who who isn't quite, what do you call that? Uh, Pulling the trigger, not pulling the trigger. uh, uh, um, I'm pulling the trigger. Okay. No um, I guess that's where you use your feminine wiles. Mm. <laughs> Try to figure out how to maybe get him to feel more confident about asking you. But um, you could even have a conversation about that. Like, what if you had a conversation about what do you think about the fact that men have been told that they shouldn't, um, you know, whatever, the, you know, have an actual social conversation with them that might open him up and get him. To think, oh, she actually might want me to make an overture mm. because she thinks this is really bad what's going on in the culture. That's what I would do. My husband and I like to talk about I like a lot that. Of, Drop uh, a big hint. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're like great when men ask women out. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. And then he'll get the hint. I, I think a, a, a principle that I've, a, a North Star principle that I've seen with my girlfriends over the years and in my own dating history is if he really wants it and you want it, and you're around each other enough, it will work, yes. you know, And but it's not going to work. I mean, a lot of women, unfortunately, I find, you know, over the years I've heard from a lot of women who they really wanted it, but he didn't want it as bad. He didn't want her as badly. It's, he didn't maybe want marriage. And so she's just kind of in his orbit, like just waiting and waiting and hoping and praying. And and all I can say to that is that that is a message. If you are mm-hmm. in that boat waiting, you're the waiting is the message. Waiting for him. Yeah. You shouldn't be waiting for him. I mean, you should never be waiting for a man in that way. He should. You will know when a man wants you. You'll know. He will not in any way, shape, or form cower from that. Um, and I would say a lot of things, and I learned this the hard way, hard way myself, but he does have to be in, a, in the right um a lot of times in those situations, women think that they're not wanted, like it's about them personally and they take it personally, like he doesn't love me. But it, it's very likely that he just doesn't think he can give you what you need. And if a guy doesn't feel like he can provide, it's not always about money, provide for you what you need, he's going to read that and try to distance himself from mm. you. And a lot of women will read that as just not being loved. And that actually isn't true. He might love you, but think you need somebody else because I can't give it to you. And do you think in those cases, many times he's right? Mm-hmm. And it's really hard for women to mm-hmm. accept that because they, we want to believe that love can conquer all or I'll, I'll figure it out or, um, and, and, and that sounds like in that case, they're not, they're not matched. Maybe not mm-hmm. the matches there may be. It, 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 is that like an emotional, emotional matching that's not there? Would you say, or maybe the intellectual or, matching, or an emotional matching, but not a practical matching mm. or a logistical? Ma- I mean, this was the story of my first marriage. Mm. That's why I'm, um, talking about it so emphatically. I, mm. you know, it, it can be a logistical problem, a geographical problem, uh, um, you know, wanting different things. But I love you. The love is there. And I think that's super hard for women because if the love is there, by God, certainly that was me in my 20s. If the love is there, I'll make it happen. I'll figure it out. And love isn't enough. It just isn't enough. Not for a lifetime. You need a lot more than love to make a marriage last. 
Seven Weeks Coffee is delicious, small batch roasted, ethically sourced coffee that is delivered right to your doorstep. I love Seven Weeks Coffee because they not only have delicious blends like medium Ethiopian roast, but they also donate 10% of all of their revenue back to the pro-life movement directly to serve mamas and babies in need through pro-life pregnancy resource centers. 10% of their revenue, not just their profits. It's called seven weeks coffee because at seven weeks, the baby, the preborn child is the size of a coffee bean. Also, I love their heartbeat club because at sevenweekscoffee.com, you can sign up to get a monthly subscription of delicious coffee delivered right to your door. And when you join the heartbeat club, you get a special discount using the code Lila at checkout for 25% off your first order. So go check out sevenweekscoffee.com, buy your delicious coffee from a company that supports your values and supports the pro-life movement and use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your first order. That let's, I want to go into that more because in love, you can sacrifice and love requires sacrifice, Mm -hmm. true love. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, some of the best sort of stories, you know, are, I mean, well, Romeo and Juliet, I wouldn't say is a good love story. It's actually a terrible love story when you think (laughs) about it because they kill Kill themselves. themselves. Uh, So don't do that. (laughs) But, you know, there's the stories of falling in love with each other and it's not practical. Yeah because of economic reasons or social status reasons, Mm -hmm. health reasons, and the couple still, cultural reasons, and the couple still defies the odds Mm -hmm. and makes it work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very inspiring. It is. And it's very addicting to the woman who loves romance and says, well, I'll make, I'll be one of them. I'll do that. If there's, if there's 3% that do it, I'll be part of the 3%. But it takes two to tango, right? Yeah, it does. So I think, I think that what you're saying is not that it, if I'm, (sighs) tell me if I'm misunderstanding It's not that that can't work. It's that that won't work unless they both go all in on it. 100%. So so you can't live that by yourself. You have to have the man fully engaged. And yes, we're going to overcome these Mm -hmm. health challenges or these, you know, family differences, cultural differences, whatever. If you're both in it to win it, anyone can win it. Definitely. But if he's not in it. Definitely. Or she, but usually, I mean, I shouldn't say usually, but yes, either one. Um. Yeah, like I think I think um I think the fact that people are products of divorce, so many people are products of divorce today is, has been an incredibly huge handicap for them in trying to build their own families. And my husband is a product of divorce, and what made it different is that he knew from day 1 he was on a mission, you know, to do whatever it took to not let that happen to his to himself or his family. And that's a broader mission. And I I believe this. I believe people have to have, going back to what I said, love is not enough. You have to have some sort of mission that you're on, whether it's spiritual, whether it's just keeping your family together, Mm -hmm. whether it's not ending up like your parents, whatever, bigger than your feelings for the day or the month or the week or the year or the event that's going on. Mm -hmm. Because there are all these things that will transpire that will make you, most people, rethink It's normal to wonder if you married the right person, even if you have a great marriage. It's normal to have seasons where your marriage isn't great, even though the marriage is great. Mm -hmm. In other words, it doesn't feel great or it's not working great, but that doesn't make it not a great marriage. It just means you're going through this huge hump. So there's so many different ways to look at marriage that is healthy and helpful and so different from what you'll ever Mm -hmm. get from the culture and certainly from Hollywood. (laughs) When you say love is not enough, you're not talking about love the choice. You're talking about love the feeling. Yes, love the feeling. Oh, definitely yeah. love the feeling. You're not going to always feel in love mm-hmm. and you're not always going to even feel loving on a given day or a given week. That's why it's sacrifice and that's why it's a higher calling to be married for a lifetime. And and not many people, unless they are steeped in you know, very, for religion, for example, is an obvious one, um, because for some that is their strength and motivation for marriage, and um, that's falling by the wayside, as you know, as mm-hmm. well. So there's just not a lot for people to grab onto, I think, when it comes to marriage, and they just are looking for help and can't find it. I want to talk about the marriage, the practical considerations around choosing who to marry. Mm-hmm. Because obviously you need to be attracted. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I've had people ask me, we have everything else, but I'm not really attracted to them. Is that okay? I'm like, what? Why did you even ask that? 
where how far have we gotten that that's even a question sorry i interrupted you, yeah but well i, had I mean to say it's that. the dating app world yeah. question too because okay. you're like oh we connect on these levels and share no, these interests no. but when i actually talk to him or meet him in person i'm like not no, drawn to this person no. in that way yeah and then people say well some people say it will come in time and yeah that has happened to people yeah. i just wouldn't want to personally bank on it mm -hmm. it may but i yeah no. and then how long do you then, how, how long yeah. of a time do you do you give it yeah 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 that could get hairy so you need to be attracted mm -hmm. and you talked earlier about the good man who's marriageable and employable or employed at, at minimum employable or employed talk to me more about yeah. what that means um, and what women should be looking for and then i also want to talk about it from the perspective of the man because a man you know, should be employed or employable, should be able to be a provider. Yeah. And what does that look like? Yeah. Then like for the woman, what's her side of the equation? You mean for what she brings to the table? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean. Okay. So for, for women, because they're no longer, you know, back in the day, find a man who can support you. Right. You see that on the, on the old mm -hmm. films or whatever, or even TV shows. And that's considered so horrible because women can take care of themselves. It is just as important for women today as it was 50 years ago, to have a man who can provide. Because even though we now do provide in a way that we didn't in the past, that ability, sorry, not the ability, that whole experience of providing for ourselves will feel different when you have a baby. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have a baby and feel then empowered and emboldened to leave him or her and go out and provide for him or her. That's not what's gonna happen to you as a woman for most women, especially if you're married and, well, definitely if you're married. But even if you're not, that's your first instinct is, to, is gonna be to care for your baby emotionally, physically, not leave them. A man's initial reaction to becoming a father, his desire for breadwinning doesn't recede, it ramps up. As soon as he sees baby, oh my God, I got to go into, you know, hyper providing mode. Oh my God, my mm -hmm. life is so much more um, meaningful now. And I have this little person who needs me in that mm -hmm. to provide. So our natural responses aren't even the same. And it's that when the relationship starts to get a little hairy because nobody told women you need a man who can provide. So what will happen is she'll, she will, maybe she married somebody who makes a lot less or not just that, but who... Um, isn't on a, a real trajectory for providing for the long haul or who has not quite found himself yet or they made decisions, like we said earlier, based on two incomes instead of one. And then when they try to back off of that, his salary looks a lot different without hers. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're dating, you need to still pay attention to where a man is on the career trajectory path. Um, even though that seems, uh, what's the word, retro, because it isn't retro. It may feel retro in the moment when you're doing, thinking about it, but it won't be five years from now. So presumably you'd be having that conversation about whether or not you want to stay home when you're dating. He will know if you've said that, that it's going to be on him. I mean, he's going to know. He knows this quickly if you're a career woman or you are temporarily pursuing a career and then you're going to step out and go back or, or you're going to step out permanently, you're going to have a large family. I mean, he's going to know based on these things you tell him and he's going to, oh, he's gonna, like, he's going to do the math in his head about how much he's going to have to, um, like not, not so much how much you make, because this isn't about marrying a rich man. This is about making sure that you, um, that he's on his path and he's found his way. You don't want to uh, gamble on that. Now, what would, so, what would the what would what would, what are you talking about in the negative? Like, what would it look like that he's not on his path? He doesn't really he doesn't care about. He doesn't know what he's going to do yet, or he and he doesn't not really into care his job. He's much. just got a he has a dead end job, and he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Oh, but that's okay. I love him, or I'm going to show him the way, or that kind of thing. No, he has to have already been on his way, um, and no what he's going to do to provide because your feelings toward him aren't going to be enough down the road. They're not taught to think like that anymore. You know, even parents don't tell their daughters to look for a man who's, they don't, they're scared. Even parents. I mean, you asked me about religion mm -hmm. or churches rather their response to the cultural feminist stuff. Like they've jumped on board. Parents have too. They're scared to say, 
like I said, raise your daughters differently than your sons. You're both capable of doing these things, but here's what it's likely to look like for you down the road. I think they're scared of getting it wrong, meaning they might push a woman or encourage a girl that this guy is more marriageable in terms of he has a job or he's seeking a career path of some kind, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, but that guy might have some other terrible issues with him, even though he has these good things going on. Like he is employable or he has a good job, meaning. Well, it's not all, it's not enough. Right. It's not yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. No, it, we're no, talking no. prerequisites. It's a pre yeah. It's just a yeah. basic bare yeah. Like it, you're employed or you're not, or you yeah. know where you're going or you don't. And you're probably not going to want to wait around to see whether or not it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the issue. It's not, this is all that matters and don't worry if he's got character. Or, but uh, I think yeah. that I think the core there is you want someone who's hardworking, mm -hmm. honest and driven. Yes. Driven, not because they're necessarily just want to be like the boss of the world, but maybe they do, but driven because they want to be able to provide. Yes. Because, right. I, you know, there's so many stories about those young couples who get married at 19 and they built, you know, he had, he came from nothing. He had nothing, mm -hmm. but he was going to work really hard and pursue every opportunity to provide. And he makes it. You know, and they build that life together. So so you're not saying you should just go find someone who is already made it. You're talking about no. finding someone who's on you, the path. Correct. Who yeah. who's found his purpose. Maybe that's a mm -hmm. better way of saying it. Who's has a plan. How about that? A man with a plan. Because you might meet him at 19 or 20. Mm -hmm. He's not making anything yet, or he's has not but he's he knows what you know, you said um that that a woman should know what she wants and who she is before mm -hmm. she even dates, right? So should he. Yeah. That's it. You're looking for two people who know who they are and where they're going. And that might even seem like a tall order because so many people in our culture don't know where yeah, they're I going. Know, know. They don't, they're, what, they're wrestling with who they are. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what marriage means. I mean, but we're at that's complete... not somebody who's marriageable right. at that time, right? male or female. Right. That person is not ready. Right. And sometimes they're 45 year olds who aren't male and female. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a really good point you made mm. at the beginning is knowing who you are and what you want, or don't even be looking to get married because you're not really ready for the market. Now you have some really good advice on living on a, being able, making your decisions yeah. based on the economic practicality of living on one income. Yeah. Talk to me more about that. I thought that was really interesting. So in the ideal world, again, you're talking about this in advance of having children really in advance of getting married so that when you're with somebody and you're in a relationship that's looks like it's headed somewhere, you are already making plans for what you want that to look like. Should you get married? Okay. If you know that somebody, if, if you've stated and you're clear that you want to step out of the workforce and stay home for X amount of years, then obviously you need to start making financial decisions in advance of that, i.e. do not buy, do not get used to two incomes. Mm -hmm. So you're both working right now, but you know that's not going to be the case. Don't get comfortable with two incomes and then all of a sudden drop one. Practice living on less now um, or more economically. Even if you have the money coming in, put that money aside save it as much as you can mm -hmm. so that you can add that pile to his income down the road when you do get married and stay home. So there's that. You could actually plan for that in advance. Get out of debt. Um, so those are the kind of the kind of the advanced obvious things. And then not buying the house based on two incomes, mm -hmm. all of that. Once you do get married and have kids, if you haven't, even if you haven't done those things, more often than not, that second income in those early years is actually not advantageous at all from a, I'm just talking strictly from a financial standpoint, because I think even if you made a hundred thousand dollars, it's not worth not being home. That's my bias. Well, and in a lot of but states, a hundred thousand dollars, if well, it's a job that requires, if it's a hundred thousand dollars and it's a job that requires you to be out of the home in an office, eight hours a day, even yeah. just a childcare expenses against that money after taxes. That's true too. It's like you're being paid below minimum rate wage to be away from your kids for eight hours a day. That's true. But of course, most people don't make six figures. So if you're looking at the average, I'm talking about two people, right. making two, two people would have to make at least six figures each for it to potentially come out in the wash from a financial standpoint. But that's not most people's mm. situation. Most people, that second income is being eaten up by taxes and then the childcare costs being the biggest, and then all the costs that are incurred by going out to work. Mm -hmm. So when I spend time at home, a lot of time, let's say in a given week at home doing 
my entrepreneurial things from my house. I actually spend a lot, practically nothing. Right. <laughs> if I have a week where I'm not doing that and I'm out, I'm shopping, mm-hmm. I'm getting food, more food, I'm spending more on gas. I'm, I don't know, somehow you have you're to, just, you get have to clothing for yes, the part and all yeah. the things. I mean, so yes. what you're saying, okay. so I, I want to make sure folks listening to, this is such an important point. You have a, a situation as do I, and a lot of people today, thankfully, this is increasingly the way the workforce is going with a lot of jobs where you have flexible work yes. that you can largely do from home. Obviously you're here in the studio. So once in a while you'll go do an interview, but, and I do in the studio, but most of my time I'm in my home and that's a huge privilege. It's a great thing. And it makes it much more doable when you have kids. I mean, I know your kids are older, mine are, mine are little, but you're talking about when you say, um, when you're, t- when you're talking about those jobs that don't allow that flexibility back to that flexible, yeah. uh, advice you're giving and that don't allow you to do it from home. Meaning, how do you feel about the mother who's working part-time from home and she loves her work and it's working with the kids? Yeah. So I think there are caveats to that. I think it's the greatest situation that you could possibly have. I think in the ideal world, you're not doing much of anything in those early years, Mm -hmm. um, maybe 10 hours a week kind of a thing. And then you ramp that up when the kids go to school into Mm part-time. I'm the full time is a disaster in my opinion, even when they're in school, because people think that all of a sudden you have this all time and the all this time in the middle of the day and it just doesn't work out that way. Um, but be that as it may, there are so many aspects of being able to work from home when you have kids. Like for example, when I was writing, that was when my kids were asleep or when they were in school. Like for a long time, they said, I wouldn't even know you worked mom if I didn't know you worked. Mm. They never saw it. So there are ways to work around that. Some people work at night. I can't, I got to have my sleep. So I never worked at night, but some people work into the wee hours of the night. And then, um, but go back to the, fin- I want to finish the financial mm-hmm. thing. Cause I think that was your initial question. More often than not, that second income, once people put the math and put the pen to the paper and they look at it and they subtract the childcare, this is assuming you don't have free mm-hmm. childcare with family members or something. That's a different ball game. And the commuting costs and the gas and the eating out and the convenience foods and the this, the, the. maybe you're netting $10,000, maybe mm-hmm. a year. And when you see it like that, going back to what you were saying about some women, and I get this a lot, trying to help their husband understand um, that it's important for them to be home and can she quit her job and stay home. And she's getting flack from him about that. The, put it on pen and paper. <laughs> Men will respond to the math more easily um, than anything else, in my opinion. And when they see that and then compare that to the climate that's in the home and the fallout of trying to both work while raising babies and toddlers and the chaos that ensues from that, most men would be very grateful to have a calmer, more peaceful home and wife and $10,000 less a year or whatever it is. Like it's worth it to them. But because it's so countercultural, you have to really... um, gosh, have a long, long drawn out conversation about it because sometimes people just haven't even heard it from this angle before. They just believe this is what you have to do. And they've never actually put it to paper to see, is this coming out in the wash? What if you're in a situation where you bought that house on two incomes and your your spouse's, your husband's income is not enough to cover that? What would you tell that couple? Sell and it. she's, sell it. Sell it. Move. Where? I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. Get family around you. I mean, you, mm. it's going to take hard. It, it, it's going to be hard. If you made a mistake, you can undo a lot of mistakes. Mm. It may be painful financially, especially initial an initial hit. Maybe you even move cities to what be if, closer to your family. What if the family. husband loves the career that he's in and he's he really likes the job that he's in, but he doesn't provide enough to do a one-income household in that area, one-income family? Uh, Say that again. So he loves so his career, like, but just doesn't likes, make enough to do one income. It's not making enough to do Pick one up a income. Job. So many side gigs now. That's true. Make a way is what you're saying. If you love your job and it doesn't make a lot, like mm-hmm. you're sacrificing providing more that your family needs physically because you just love the job. I get it. But then there's a trade-off for that and you're going to have to pick up some more some more money somewhere in order to get that that um happy factor, I guess, that you have during the day with that job you love. You told a bunch of women during the pandemic to leave big cities and move to the Midwest. I did. Yeah. I, that you? sounds like something I'd say. Um, <laughs> do you still recommend that largely? That yeah. We should avoid living in big cities. Yeah. Now, 
this is, it, it depends on what kind of life you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived in the city. I lived in several cities throughout my twenties and I loved it. And that was fine for that point in my life. But, um, you couldn't pay me to like live that lifestyle when I was nesting, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you want a simpler, calmer, peaceful, non-chaotic, um, more financially feasible life for five, 10 years. Yeah. Get out of the city for sure. People do it all the time. I mean, I talk to people all the time who are doing, who want to do it. It's not like I have to convince them to do it again, sort of like the priorities change. Hmm. All of a sudden the city doesn't look so, so appealing. Um, and of course the reason I would have said the Midwest is, um, because things are so much cheaper there than on, than on the coasts. And I lived up east for 10 years, and um, that too was a big fight with my ex-husband because he was a New Yorker, and uh, he wanted that life, and um, I didn't. And now he's there, and I'm here, or I'm in the Midwest, and, you know, you, you go where you need to go to have the life that you want. And if it didn't, you know, if you made a mistake in that decision, a lot of decisions can be, mistakes can be undone in time, maybe not right then, but you know, if not now, eventually, I'm um, not, everything is so, I'm just not somebody who believes that you make a decision and you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. Um, or, or that there's two paths and you take this one, your life's going to be great. And you take this one, you're screwed. Like, I don't even, I don't even subscribe to that. Most things are fixable. Yeah. If you're, with, I believe that. I, I completely agree with that. And I also believe that God works through our, even our mistakes, mm -hmm. not to say we should go be making mistakes and not try to, uh, you know, own up avoid to them, them and right, avoid right, them yeah, in yeah. the future <laughs> and learn our lesson, right, right, right? right? But that God has a way of using our, even our mistakes when we own up to them and try to fix them and everything for Definitely. long term for good. Definitely. And that's his mercifulness. I mean, he's I so agree. merciful with all of us. Um, you've mentioned a few times your first marriage, you just mentioned again, your ex-husband, mm -hmm. Any advice on, or what, what would be, you know, you, based on your experience, yeah. what was, what went wrong there? I thought love was enough. Feelings. Or, yes. Sorry. Feelings. Um, there was no question of love. That was just not even a thing. We'd been together a really long time too. Um, our values and priorities were completely out of whack. It's as simple as that. Completely out of whack. Did you know that going into the marriage? I, I did. I did. And so did he, I think, and we thought we could overcome them. And they came barreling forward very quickly within several years that um, we should have listened before we did it. But we've been together a long time, and, well, you're there already. You know, you're like, you don't want to start over, or you think... Um, there's a lot of people like that, and my heart really goes out to them. when they. I think there's a lot of women, especially when they're like 10 years down the road and they're in that boat. I was 23, so... I had some time on my hands, but there's a lot of women who will just stay with them because they don't want to be alone or they don't want to start over. And so rather, rather have somebody as opposed to nobody. That wasn't really my story, but I feel for them because they think there's going to be nothing else out there. So might as well just take this, which of course is just an accident waiting to happen. Because that's not how you get married or that, certainly that's not how you should go into a marriage. Um, Did you have the same view of marriage? Of no, what marriage you no, meant? no, no. No, awesome question. I did write about mm -hmm. that in one of my books, actually. No. Um, he definitely would not have had a uh, biblical view of marriage. Let's put it that way. Um, so in the in the Catholic Church, we have this thing called annulments, which people say, well, that's Catholic divorce. And it's not what it is. And sometimes people who get annulment, they always usually are legally, they always are legally divorced but in an annulment, it's it's the church decides it, and it's because there wasn't a marriage to begin with, even though it might have looked like one. So I got an annulment in order to raise my kids Catholic when I got married the second time, and I went through that. And that's funny that you brought that up. Um, it's so important because though. I, because yeah. at first I didn't, you know, I wasn't Catholic, and mm -hmm. I was doing it just, you know, for my kids' sake, so that we could, mm -hmm. so I could remarry my husband in the Catholic Church. Because when we got married originally, it wasn't in a Catholic Church, and I wanted to send my kids to Catholic school. So mm -hmm. that's we went. I went through all that for them. Um, and I, I had a, I had a certain view of annulments before I did it. And then I went through it and I had a change of heart and I watched because you have to have your 
ex go through it with you? Well, you don't have to, but that's the ideal mm -hmm. way. And I asked him to, and he actually said yes and started the process. And halfway through, he just said, I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. And I had to finish it on my own, which you can do. And I, I remember that was really interesting because I came away with a very much more under, a, a better understanding of what annulment really meant mm -hmm. um, than he was able to see because he was not raised with any religion and did not, I mean, religion was, a, was an issue. And um, I understand now what you just said in a way that I wouldn't have before I did it. I did think it was well, just saying that you were never married by law. My mother taught me that actually just said, just pretending that you weren't married by law. And that's actually not true. That's not mm -hmm. what it was. And um, I agree with it. I agree with the whole process of it. It's right. We weren't, we shouldn't have gotten married to begin with. Um, it wasn't really a marriage. I mean, it was legally, but that's the only way it was. Hmm. In my opinion. Can you share any more about that? We haven't actually gotten into annulments on the show yet. We've touched on it before, but if there's any other, I don't, I don't know. It's been so long that I mean, if you had asked me right when I had answered all the questions, I'd have a lot more to say. I don't. Maybe from the, the perspective than... of someone who's considering getting married, what were the things? Maybe the red flags. You already mentioned oh, you yeah. share values because it, for the annulment process, my understanding is you make your relationship. You you know report on it basically yes. to the church. Yes. And they, in their wisdom, decide, oh, you you didn't go into this with That's a right. full, open-hearted yes. promise. You know, if one of the spouses went into it actually holding back, thinking, I might divorce this person, yes. I'm not really fully committing to this person at the time of the marriage, that doesn't make a marriage because they yeah. weren't going into it ready, willing to fully commit, as an example. There's other factors yep. involved, too. Yep. So it was, um, it was not an agreement. And I tell people that now you have to have the same view of marriage to make it work. Cause sometimes you're just going to stay married because you said you would mm. and because you're not going to get divorced and not because of any other reason. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, so you have to have that same attitude for sure. Um, the values and the priorities are everything. If you're not going to the same place and you don't put the same things first, then it's not going to work. Cause how do you ever align priorities? If you're not aligned when you say, I mean, you, they might, I guess it could change your the priorities do sometimes change and you can hope that they'll align later, but you better align them when you're getting married. Um, and then a geography was a huge thing for us. I was made, raised in the Midwest. He was, he was a New Yorker and he thought he probably still thinks I imagine there's no life outside of New York. <laughs> like New Yorkers are, there's New York and then there's the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and we used to fight about that a lot. So I know that geography is a big deal today with people because mm -hmm. they are all over the place and they're trying to figure out where they're going to live um, in a way that wasn't so big in the 80s. Um, well, I was 19, it was 91 when I got married the first time. So that that was in a kind of an unusual situation. And But the geography goes back to the values because mm -hmm. I wanted a family, a simple family life um, and he wanted something different. So how do you marry those? The, I mean, how, how can those things did possibly come kids? together? He did end up having two kids and he married a... But when a, you were with him, did he want... I mean, Yes, yeah, so I there said was, he did. That was part of the plan longer term. Yes, definitely. But, but in New always York. Later, <laughs> always yeah. later, yeah. always later, yeah. always when... Always later and always um, after he had attained a certain level of wealth. Mm -hmm. And uh, just... just did, yeah. That's what I mean by priorities. Just a completely different mindset about how to live and about what matters. What are some key questions you think that you mentioned just kind of closing the loop on dating and selecting for a spouse? There are a lot of great advice you had, but some of the things you're looking for, like maybe the questions that you should be asking. In your to, head or uh, to them? To them, to, oh, to, yeah, them yeah, yeah. to make sure you're on the same page. Yeah. Well, there's some really obvious ones that I'm surprised people don't don't talk about. And that is and that's the work family thing is how are we going to arrange who's going to work and who's going to stay home and how much and how often and where, and what's that going to look like? And what are you talking about when you say you want to work part-time? What's it you like really get into the minutia of, sorry, I'm not making noise, really get into the minutia of what you want your life to look like. Like think five, 10 years down the road. What do you, what do you want your daily life to look like? Are you both getting up at the same time every day and running out the door and not eating at home and paying other people to raise your kids and coming home at the end of the day and then running around on the weekends to do all the errands or like that's one lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a completely different kind of lifestyle where one person's 
perhaps leaving or perhaps not these days since there's so much working from home, but where you're creating a home and you're cooking at home and you're um, raising your children yourself so that it's just an incredibly slower existence, which I think is another big thing that we should probably mention. I think that's why a lot of women struggle with this, by the way, is because the times in which we live are so fast and so immediate. And everything is right now, right now, right now. And the whole process of raising littles is so opposite of that. Mm. They, they could not, they're, they're, they are the living embodiment of, of snails. You have to move like a snail to be with them in those years. I mean, everything is excruciatingly slow because that's who they are. So you have to stop and live their life with them. And we're trying to fit them into our fast paced life and it's not working. I think people really struggle with how do you even move slowly, live slowly, live simply. Um, and then you have the extreme going to the living off the land trad wife movement, which is whatever. That's great. But not most people aren't going to want to go that far. So like, is there a middle ground? What does that look like? And how do you do that? And how do you get off your phone and stop doing this when you have littles? I mean, I can't even imagine having had social media or a phone available to me when my kids were little. That would be awful being torn between that um, and your kids all the time. Like my phone, my kid, my phone, my kid. I'm like, we didn't have that. So um, it's a lot harder today. It's just harder for your generation. Any way you look at it, I think, this whole parenting thing, motherhood thing. Don't look, you? I, I think that is what I understand. I mean, I, I can't, I didn't live my mother's life. Yeah. You know, I can ask her questions about it and I was it her child, right? Yeah. Um, thankfully, I love my mom. But yeah, it is. I, from all accounts, mm -hmm. there are significant differences and the challenges mm -hmm. to raise kids and to date and to marry today. Yes. But when I look at history, you know, I studied history in college because I love history, although I learned mo mo most of the things I know about history, not from my time at college, by the way. But when you look at history, yeah. every every generation has its different struggles and yes, challenges. For sure. And we always look back in the time and say, well, they didn't have that. And it's harder for me today, but That's true. some things are easier today. Yes, so it, I think there's always going to be trade-offs with every era. And, it, you know, God allows us to be born at this time in history for us to rise to the occasion, you know, rise to the challenges of the moment. And, and anyway, that's why I love the work that you're doing and the, a lot of the advice that you're giving, because I think it's it's helping people practically make sense of the time that we're in. I hope so. Because that, to navigate yeah. where we're at. Thank you. I hope so. Because that's, it, this really isn't about politics. It's mm -hmm. just, it's about how to live a life that works for you, that's going to make you happy. And who cares what everybody else is mm -hmm. doing, you know, or, or what you think you're supposed to do or how you're told you're supposed to do it. Listen to your heart, listen to what you want, and don't be afraid to say what you want, even if it sounds countercultural. There's that mm -hmm. word again, countercultural or something that your friends aren't saying or doing. Um, be true to what you want. And that, that, again, that goes back to what you were saying about knowing who you are and what you want before you're even in the dating pool, right? Ideally. Any last advice for avoiding, you're kind of touching on it right now, but avoiding the temptation to compare. Mm. And I think, I mean, we were talking about social media. Social media is like the space, if you're sucked into it and you see even the trad wife living this idyllic mm -hmm. life over here, and then you see this other woman over here seemingly to accomplish so much, and you just see this whole this whole world of all these different people and they're all shining in these different lanes. And I can see why so many women and men today are struggling with, especially women though, what is my lane and how do I, I want this thing that I like and that thing that I like. That's what I mean. That's what I was referring to when I was saying, I think it's so much harder like that, that, in, that in and of itself is such a burden to bear because we as humans, even pre-social media, are prone to compare to our neighbor, even if there isn't social media. Like you're going to talk about your neighbors or your friends, and that's what people do. But to be bombarded with these lifestyles that look so amazing and are all curated and it's all crap. It's not real. That's the thing that's, that gets me the most. It's you're looking at something that has just been curated for your entertainment. And somewhere in your brain, you think that's actually real and you want it or you should have it. And you're comparing it to what you're doing and you want to, and then it makes you feel less about your mm -hmm. life. Honestly, the only true way to really avoid going down that path is to turn it off. 
It's really the only answer. And so people will say, well, how is that possible? You can't live in a world where you turn it off. Well, A, yes, you can. You can turn it off. And you can turn it off but periodically. I was just going to say, yeah. if, if it's too much to just turn it off completely, mm-hmm. then you have super strict rules about when you look at it and you put, on, put it on a timer. I think you can actually do this on your phone now, my daughter told me. You get 30 minutes a day. And then you go and you zone out and you just have whatever. You zone out for those 30 minutes. And there's stu- there is stuff on social media that's, that's worthwhile. I don't mean it's all, you know bad. But the most important thing is if you're going to spend those 30 minutes looking at it, really look at it as entertainment or maybe learning about something you didn't know and keep your life over here in a really special box that you know, this has nothing to do with that. Never put them next to each other because all grass looks greener. It all, it all will. There is just as much dirt over there as there is in your yard. You just can't see it. And you especially can't see it on social media. You have to know that going in before you give yourself your 30 minutes. Really know that. And if you don't know that, don't turn it on until you do. You really got to get that in your brain to be able to separate and not let it affect you. That's good. That's really good. Suzanne, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me, Lila. Where can people find your work? Um, my website, just Suzanne Benker, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com. And that'll lead you. Lots of other places. And your latest book out is what again? How to Build a Better Life, A New Roadmap for Women Who Want to Prioritize Love and Family. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose Podcast. Guys, it helps so much when you subscribe to the show and you also rate the show. If you're listening on podcast app right now on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us five stars and leave us a review. That actually helps the podcast reach more people on the apps. Also, if you're watching here on YouTube, make sure you're already subscribed and that you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss another episode. Lastly, don't forget about our Locals community. We are doing now Locals subscribers only only streams after we do our YouTube lives, usually once a week. And this is a special space where we're hanging out with just the Locals crew. So go to the link in the bio to join our Locals page. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, spreading the faith across the globe. Discover news, entertainment, and deepen your faith at EWTN.com.